how to start your radio show, say name of show and introduce the host. Hello everybody, this is Mac Precise and I am the 11 o'clock waffle. <laughs> Back to the third series of the 11 o'clock waffle. A lot has happened since we've been away. We've had the Winter Olympics, the return of Sherlock, and of course it wouldn't be a waffle without mention of Doctor Who and Matt Smith's passing of the screwdriver to Peter Capaldi. But fear not, we aim to provide a third series that's not been written after spending too much time reading Tumblr. With that in mind, there should not be a drunk edition of the show, no rooftop kiss between Edgar and James, and neither will Luciana dulcet tones become the full-time host. In case you haven't heard the show before, we take the lighter stories from the week's news and add a dollop of ice cream on top. That's the show. Let's meet the guests. As it's the first show back, no expense has been spared. I literally mean that no expense has been spared because none of our guests are being paid to be here. What? That's not what I was told. Hang on a minute. <laughs> first Let's up... Let's form a union. <laughs> first up, he made his debut last series and quickly established himself as a top waffler. Taking time out from watching birds playing as Bush, it's Los Shanahan. I may have misheard that last bit. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Hello, how are you, Los? I'm good, I'm good. Yeah, I am I am I am keeping well. It's wonderful to be back on the waffle. Um, I'm enjoying very much the waffle studio. It looks an awful lot like my own bedroom. It's a very faithful recreation, so uh, thanks for that. Okay, it's springtime, and you've been uh, watching many birds in the bush? I have, I have. Although the last time I was down my local reserve, I didn't see birds so much as I saw frogs. And uh, being springtime, they were mating, and a lot of them formed themselves into sort of what I can only describe as an amphibian ball. Uh, yeah. Much to the horror of nearby children who were trying to work out what it was by poking it with a stick. <laughs> <laughs> the wonders of nature! The bird your eyes, children. <laughs> <laughs> I think the amount of Loz related animal anecdotes that have been on this show, we could just have a whole podcast. Elephants? Have I told you, Paris? Have I told you about the time I saw a buzzard? <laughs> cats. Magical. Cats? cats, yeah. I have a few stories about cats. <laughs> this man has traced the city lights of Exeter for the light at the end of the road in Helston. It's the feck father himself, Christopher Stanley. The pinky and the brain, yes, pinky and the brain. Hola, hola. good One evening. How are you, Chris? Yes, yes. It's it, it hail today. Someone hasn't really woken up the idea of spring yet. Yeah. Hail Caesar. Yeah, indeed. Welcome back to the show, Chris. Hello. And last up, he surrendered his crown as the champion of the waffle last year to Jenny Roberts. Will 2014 see a return of the Duncan? Welcome back, the owner of that glorious ponytail, Mr. Edgar Duncan. Good day, sandwiches. Yes, I will take back my crown. Someday. How are you, Ed? I'm doing good, thanks. Yeah, I'm feeling perky. But well, it is spring, so, you know. It's... <laughs> Nothing better than a perky Edgar. Yeah! I think that's a cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> if it's not, perky it should be. Edgar. <laughs> So that's the intro done. Let's have some questions. Right. Question Huzzah. number one. After Andre Mariner sent off Kieran Gibbs instead of Alex Oxlar Chamberlain at the weekend, what other examples are there of mistaken identity? Loz. Well, two, I think, this week. Firstly, I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest the entire Welsh rugby team. Um, I've got a theory going that at the start of the recent Six Nations, the Irish team actually stole the Welsh kit. So for the entire season, the Welsh were forced to play dressed up as the Irish. So when the Irish won, it was actually the Welsh and no one knew. that. that <laughs> that's the only possible explanation for the, Wel- for the Welsh team not winning the Six Nations. Um, but an incredible story recently about a woman um, in Iceland, the country, not the frozen food emporium, uh, who was on a tour bus and they stopped somewhere for an ice cream and some fermented herring, which is very popular in Iceland. And she nipped into the loos and changed her top. And when she came out of the loos, no one recognised her when she got back on the bus. They just assumed she was a passenger they hadn't previously uh, seen. Um, And a search was then uh, called 
for the passenger who was presumed to have gone missing who had been wearing her previous set of clothes. A search was immediately instigated across the Icelandic landscape, which went on until about 3 a.m., uh, when they discovered the woman was with them the whole time, the wonderful thing about them was that she was actually part of the search party, having not realised what had happened. <laughs> oh dear. I'm not likely to find a, a, a new story this year that I enjoy more, I have to say. You've got to search for the hero inside yourself. <laughs> yeah, and, and she did, and found them, you know, at three o'clock in the morning in Iceland. <laughs> was she that just waiting have... for a, a reward to be put out and go, oh, found me? I can only I can only assume, yeah. They um the, the reason why it took so long is they originally said that they were going to put a bounty on her head, um, but she preferred caramel. No oh dear. Oh. Uh, it's not going to get any better. Why didn't Ed. they? Not for me anyway. Why didn't they just do a head count? <laughs> I see, see the number of times I've seen this story and that that's never occurred to me. Okay. Yeah. Ed. Ed. Hello. Edgar. Send out a search party. Oh, God, no. We Is it my Edgar. turn? I didn't hear anything. Okay. <laughs> Hello, Edgar. Hello. <laughs> now, I try and remember this is the light, fluffy waffle show. Let's oh, yeah. avoid the, last the year's of... dark <laughs> depression start. Okay. <laughs> or mysterious disappearance. Okay. Several kids died yesterday. Um, Guy Coma, <laughs> mistaken. <laughs> no, he, um, okay, yeah, a guy called uh, Guy Coma. I'm sure you've heard of this story. Oh. But it never ceases to make me chuckle. Oh, yeah, um, it's wonderful. Was... Yeah, he was mistaken for a tech expert um, Guy uh, Cuny from uh, Wireless Online on a BBC, um, an in- interview on the news program, actually. And she, basically, he was asked to discuss um, a few years back the progression of music being downloaded from the internet and how it changed the music industry. And poor Guy Goma was basically invited on thinking um, because they thought he was guy cuny from wireless and in fact he was just there for a job interview um, so there he was invited onto the set live in front of the cameras and asked what he thought about the industry and it, it's amazing watching it back on youtube and everything his face just <laughs> emits this <laughs> absolute terror well, for about five no, for about three seconds. He genuinely maybe. does the bottom lip wobble, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, he does. And then he just goes, in his head, screw it, I'm going to continue forward and I'm going to answer this as best I can. And he does an amazing job considering he's entirely the wrong guy. Um, and I think actually the reporter probably gets this fed into her um, earpiece that he is the wrong person because I think about three questions in, she suddenly starts going through loads of stuttering and sort of going, um, um, now, now we go to our um, um, reporter at, um, and she, she does that, and I think it suddenly it becomes a realisation for the entire news crew. But it's amazing. I love it. Something similar that might, um, might uh, tickle your funny bone um, along similar lines to the domestic news story, uh, the, the confusion with the news guy there, was there was a clip from a news show in America recently where they were talking about um, the recent heavy storms that have hit. Oh, yeah. And they cut to a shot of one of the guys who was in the studio. They cut to a shot of his, of his... He's holding an iPad as he's delivering this, and they cut to his iPad screen. And he's got a photo up there on, from Twit, uh, on Twitter of a town hit by the storms. And then it... I don't know what happened. The touch screen messes up or something, and it starts to scroll through. And the second picture that comes through is someone dressed as Batman, and he says, oh, that's Batman. And then the, sec- the next picture that comes up, being broadcast live on American News, is a picture of a man with his... Um, well, part of his anatomy poking out through a hole in his clothing, quite visually. And this is broadcast live in HD on American News. Oh, dear. Hi, Tony. San Diego. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here's a big. Uh, I can't think of a schlong. word that's suitable for schlong. There we go. <laughs> and just, just the reaction of the people in the studio as this guy just sort of tried to carry on and, and do his job and report this serious news story, um, having just shown the world an enormous schlong. <laughs> okay, Chris. Edgar Duncan, you stole my answer. <laughs> Darn it. I do have a little bit more information about this one because he was actually there for an interview, like I said, to be to become an IT technician. Or as the BBC called it, it data support cleanser. Yeah. <laughs> what I love about that story is... It was, cleanser. It was, Sometimes it was, you but, get in a bottle to clean yeah, your internet history. Uh, 
<laughs> and just trying to make the job sound cooler, I guess. But Guy Cuny was sort of interviewed so about all this later on, and he was sort of saying that he's like, I'm bald, have bl- uh, dazzling blue eyes, and the sort of pale skin that makes my dermatologist wince. I'm not black. I'm not black on a startling scale, which I quite liked. Um, the the thing I love about the original story is that, in the end, no one should have been sent off because they said that Ox- the Chamberlain, even though he handballed it, um, because it was going wide anyway, so it wasn't a goal-scoring opportunity. So no one should have been sent off. Um, the other football um, mistaken identity, um, Mac will probably remember this, Graham Pohl at the 2006 World Cup. Yeah got mistaken identity he booked a croatian player called simonic but when he wrote down the booking he wrote he puts uh the yellow card in the wrong column and put it against australia's craig moore so when he booked him again uh simonic he wrote it in another column and, and looked at it and went oh i've only booked him once he then booked simonic a third time <laughs> and eventually sent him off so yes unsurprisingly graham pole was not picked uh, to carry on in the World Cup, and he retired from uh, international tournament uh, football with that same month. So yeah, I not, you were not, not. Say he retired from embarrassment. Yeah, yeah, just retired. Just just went to live as a hermit <laughs> <laughs> in the caves. Question two: A village shop vending machine has appeared in Derbyshire. The machine dispenses tin goods, milk, and fruit, saving locals long trips to the supermarket. But what would you like to get out of a vending machine, Ed? Carmex lip balm. I will elaborate, sorry. Four men, three other men on the panel going, oh, what? <laughs> Carmex lip balm. Because do, you have, is, do, you, do you put that on toast? You put it on toast? Are you you, no, you, know, you, put, you put it on your lips, lips. <laughs> and other places if you really want. Stay up. <laughs> is, that, um, is, that, is that before you put them on Twitter? And Tumblr, yeah. yeah. People like myself um, go through horrible periods where our lips get cracked, uh, particularly during the winter months, and playing a trumpet. Trumpet playing does that. And so it's actually kind of a difficult thing to find. So I think at your own convenience, you have this wonderful, you have this wonderful um, vending machine and if you can have anything in there, it would have to be that lip balm because you can get out of the vending machine because it's really hard to find anywhere else and it's a long distance to travel. You put it on your lips and that soothing feeling is wonderful. And you can continue practicing your trumpet. Screw all the chocolate digestives and milk and other things. Carmex lip balm. Okay. You're on commission. Carmex Here. lip balm. Okay, uh, Chris next. Uh, waffles, obviously. I like the idea of having a full English breakfast being delivered to you by a vending machine. I think that's kind of a flaw with vending machines at the moment. They can't really do sort of hot food products. I've met an idea from Rachel. She said dreams. Dreams from vending machines. I think that's quite a nice idea. Sort of go up to it and sort of select which one you want. No. <laughs> They'd always be empty in Arsenal Stadium, though. Uh, uh, dreams. Um, um, so you'd have this pile of people. Um, yeah. <laughs> after a while, just all sort of slumped down next to this vending machine. <laughs> Oh, oh I God. thought you meant I thought you meant dreams as am, as in ambitions. So you go to the vending machine, you put your money in, you press a button, and it come out and say professional ballet dancer. Possibly you know, it's like the power, oh, the absolute that, power. And then and then you and then you just you just be that thing. BFG comes around and tops it up every so often. Yeah, yeah. I was say it's a sort of BFG thing. Yeah, just just get him to sort of endorse it. Okay, and Loz. Um, yeah, I'd like a vending machine that dispenses village shops seeing as they're being replaced now. Um, on a slightly more personal note, can we have a vending machine that dispenses jobs? You know, people are saying at the moment that for all these <laughs> graduates that are apparently sitting around lazily, it's, it's, it's so easy for them to just go and get a job, they say. Well, if there's so many bloody jobs, how about we fill up the machines? Um, you know what? If, if, for the amount of time someone told me to just get a job when I was jobless, I think if I had a, like, a penny... For every person that said that, I would be a very wealthy man. And you wouldn't need By a job. all the Carmex lip balm ever. Go and, go and get a job. Could you, could you kindly direct me to them, madam? Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is, how about a vending machine? You put in your, your money. It'd have to be quite a small amount. And uh, what you get out is a slip of paper 
that has a joke on it to cheer you up or a witty disarming comment reminding you of some of the better things in the world or even just a picture of a baby laughing at some cheese just something cheerful that you might need in the middle of the day just to kind of you know remind you that there is a point or yeah. an episode of the 11 o'clock waffle laws yes yeah because yeah, you've got waffle episodes well, you get those machines, don't you, that do digital downloads direct to uh, you get them um, that do yeah direct to a memory stick, like one that you put in your memory stick into these vending machines. Um, they've got them in St. David's too in Cardiff, and then you just pick yeah, a movie yeah. or whatever, and it, you pay your price and it downloads it to that. So yeah, mm. I think we could get the little sort of little card that they have in Starbucks, which you put on iTunes and it downloads automatically an episode. Of the eleven o'clock waffle. Yeah, put I this like in that. and download yeah. a free show that you can listen to online on YouTube anytime. And you could put it, you could put it, you could put it in your coffee chain. So you know, you go into you go into coffee number one, and they've got a little card next to the the counter next to their coffee, and it's like, yeah, I'll have a coffee and a waffle, please. And you sit there and have your beverage and a chuckle. I, I like that idea. I also, whilst researching this, discovered the slightly disturbing fact that apparently vending machines kill thirteen people a year from from falling on them, not you know, sort of from a turning rogue. I think um. that's I think that's fewer than the number of people each year in America killed by toilet seats. They're quite it's sharp. Something, it's something like 30 people a year in America are, caught, uh, are killed by falling off slippery toilet seats. Oh, dear. Which begs so many questions. Yeah. You, Ed, um, do you I, have an inanimate object murderer-related story? Uh, oh, gum. I know people have been killed by gum by inhaling it. Um, you know, accidentally taking a breath while it's in their mouth. Ooh. Oh, come on. What? <laughs> Sorry. The, coroner's just, the coroner's there going, are you kidding me? <laughs> hey, hey, someone, like... Someone in my old marching band did die from doing that. Oh, wow. Really? Sorry, I'm just bringing the tone down. I'll, I'll lift it back up. It's gone dark again, Ed. <laughs> I like little foxes. There we go. <laughs> Question number three. Is it Donetsk? Is that how I pronounce it, Chris? Donetsk. Donetsk. Yeah, I read it as donuts. <laughs> <laughs> We've adopted donuts. <laughs> Woo! Have launched a campaign to become part of the UK. So which other places in the world would you like to adopt into Britain? Uh, Edgar? Uh, Iceland. Again, I'm going to have to follow on from this here. Not not the actual chain, but the, the country. Um, purely because I think it's sort of on its, it's, it's on its lonesome. It's sort of floating up between somewhere north of, of the UK and, and other places <laughs> that don't count because we want the UK. Um, Drifting off or losing it, yeah. <laughs> Could we have wherever it was the Clangers lived? Because I want one as a pet. The moon? Was it, yeah, was it the moon? I thought it was the Clanger planet. I'm never quite sure. We'll have that as part of the UK. Um, although, alternatively, apparently the best city in the world to live is Melbourne, the capital of Australia. So I was thinking that we could take Melbourne and just stick it where Swansea is, because we're not really using Swansea. Um, and the second, best, the second best city is apparently Vienna. So I was thinking, if we put Melbourne where Swansea is, and then we can just knock through Newport and create a lovely open plan space for Vienna, and then we can have Cardiff as a second bathroom, because um, it's always raining there anyway, so it's easier to, easier to install a shower. So that, that's my plan for Wales there. Um, but if we have to just pick one, i go with Melbourne. Okay, so I, I love the, uh, the depth of research going into there, Loz, to, to actually move pits around in Wales. Great. Yeah, just, just just redevelop Wales and slowly turn it into, you know, well, I think mostly Australia, actually. Yeah. I, I think also what you could do is you could uh, put Swansea um, where Canberra is, and the Australians would be happy with that. Because Canberra somehow is the capital of Australia. I was lied to as a child, but it's terrible. It's a terrible Is it, place. Is it Canberra? I thought it was yeah. Canberra. I've, re- I, 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 I've, I've, I've just gone. I've just gone on the waffle and said that the capital of Australia is Melbourne. Yeah. And now you're telling me it's... Bugger, quite frankly. They, 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 were, they couldn't decide between Melbourne, which is sort of like the cultural capital, and Sydney, which is sort of they thought the political capital. So they basically, well, as far as I'm concerned, Mr Stanley, I win on a cultural point. The, the argument basically went, Melbourne, Sydney, Melbourne, Sydney, Melbourne, Canberra. Like what? Yeah. <laughs> well, could, could they, is it that they couldn't pick between Melbourne, or, pick between Melbourne or Sydney? And the Prime Minister went, well, if you can't decide between the two of you, I'll give it to Canberra. Yeah, yeah, and everyone's unhappy because Canberra's terrible. Anyway, um, I'm surprised Ross think... didn't take any of New Zealand with all its sheep. Ah, <laughs> uh, um, well, we've got enough, you see. We've there's something like, well, I, I've got my own personal. Um, well, it's a harem. That's the only word for it. <laughs> it's a flock. Um, so it's a flock. 
you, some people call it a flock, you know, you, you call it, I, I just like to be honest about it. Um, so I've, I've got my own, you know, 20, 20, uh, 20 or 40, uh, 100 sheep. So, um, yeah, that's me, Arthur. Uh, Chris? <laughs> I'm not so sure about Iceland, although I like the idea that its national anthem is um, I'm All Alone, um, or maybe all by myself. But see, um, see what I mean? It needs to come and, and unify with the UK. Yeah. And then we can get Hawaii in there and maybe be Islands Anonymous or something. Um, I think that we should adopt America so we can correct its shoddy grammar, quite frankly. <laughs> I think what we should also do is adopt every single place name in America that they've nicked off us. They are so unoriginal. No, we're not having New York and New Jersey. We're taking those by, until you can get your own yeah, place maybe name. Maybe because we went over there and... and- Killed all their locals off and then renamed everything after our stuff, though, Chris. Can I also, that's, that's, Chris? That's could, so long ago. Cardiff, I might well, on the past. Cardiff would like to have a word about New South Wales. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> I also think that. Don't we tell me New South Wales isn't in America. I feel incredibly stupid. I'm going to have to check now. New South Wales is in Australia. You're not doing oh, well with Australian are, knowledge. Oh, what is it? No, I, I, well, I'm sure you're. I'm going to have to check that. I'm sure you're wrong. Knock the point off, laws. Oh, no. And he's typing on his keyboard. I, yeah, no, it is. It is New South Wales on the east coast of Australia. I might as well bow out now. <laughs> um, I also think we should adopt Columbia in South America so that we can confuse people by calling it British Columbia. <laughs> I think we should do that. Uh, no, one said, people that. No, one, no one mentioned no one mentioned Scotland. Trying to, trying to preemptively reincorporate them if they manage to break free next year. <clears throat> too I loaded. don't know. I don't know how much of Scotland I want to adopt. Definitely I, not the bit. Not definitely not the bit with Gordon Brown in. <laughs> well, uh, David Cameron's not rather happy about it. He, he gave a really grumpy press conference this week. He said that if Scotland didn't want to play anymore, he'd make his own Scotland out of green paint and some leftover Scotch eggs, and they couldn't come over and play with his Nick Clegg anymore. I've now got. So an he's image. been really, really bitter. He, 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 yeah, he said that Alex Salmond isn't allowed to his birthday party anymore. <laughs> Who wants it's, to go to David Cameron's birthday party, really? Do have some more pheasant. It's just a bully. I want to go to his birthday again. party. The standard of catering must be amazing. It wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a chocolate caterpillar cake, though, would it? Let's be honest. Ah, oh, yeah. Ain't no party like a chocolate caterpillar cake party. <laughs> you damn well know it. <laughs> Onwards to question four now. The Ministry of Justice are attempting to ban books being sent to prisoners. So which book would you want to make it compulsory for an inmate to have on their shelf to read and why? Chris. Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. <laughs> yeah. Good choice. I think so. I have to say that in, in terms of books for prisoners that are useful, there's not a lot out there. I think DVDs are better. You've got Shawshank Redemption. You've got yeah. Prison Break. You've got Porridge. It seems to be that there's much more of a DVD market for prisoners than books. Um... Oh, yeah. so you want to send prisoners prison break and teach them how to break out of prison? Well, you know, I think it would be a more constructive use of their time. If we watch prison break first, we'll already know all of the tactics they'll use, so it won't be a real problem. Exactly, yeah. Just yeah, send busy. them to the guards as well. Busy, yeah. Even yeah. Level the playing field. Yeah. Either that, or I, think, or I reckon you should send them uh, Jane Austen novels and see what effects that has on them when they come out. Oh, yes. Or Ed, no, please do Walt Flanders. <laughs> no. Ed, <laughs> what would you send into the to the prison for them to read? It has to be uh, Charles Dickens' Great Expectations because uh, in my in my head the character the convict in that called Magwitch is a criminal who has basically escaped um, his his sort of incarceration and he meets up with the main character Pip and through sort of a a good deed he repays the main character back so handsomely. And the good deed has a knock-on effect on his own life. So through one, through one good deed of, of basically sort of helping poor little Pip out, the entire story has changed and Magwitch becomes sort of a better person. I feel like every criminal should, should read that and just look at what can happen if they do reform their ways. Because I do feel like that's probably a better way to go, reforming than being locked up for goodness knows however long. So there we go. Loz. There's there's a few candidates for this, isn't there? There's Twilight. Oh, jeez. They, they should be forced to read Twilight um, <laughs> because it's going to help prevent reoffending if they knew they'd be forced to read it again if they're caught. Capital punishment. <laughs> as well, another form. Yeah, it's, it destroys the mind. 
Um, alternatively, give them Morrissey's autobiography, um, just in case the loop <laughs> paper runs out or they need something to stand on to reach a tall shelf. I, I do find it ironic that in that sense, Morrissey's autobiography is more a tool than a book, um, which says a lot about its author. <laughs> Um, or even give him Fifty Shades of Grey. And I'm, I'm not referring here to the anti-feminist sex romp, um, but Fifty Shades of Grey, the prison cell interior design guide. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case they fancy a little spruce up, you know. That book really sells. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Time for the scores now. In last place on 13 points, it's Ed. I love you all. Also on 13 points, it's Chris. Just Ooh. ahead in the lead, it's Loz on 15. Good lord. Question number five now. The Muppets Most Wanted is out in cinemas, starring the wonderful Tina Fey and the irritating Ricky Gervais. But who is your favourite Muppet? Loz. Joey Essex. <laughs> or at least he is the, the, the person who most is, uh, deserves the title of Muppet. Um, alternatively, my, always, my favourite Muppet has always been Gonzo. Uh, possibly because his nose looks like a rude implement. But I, I think genuinely um, Anne Summers are involved in some of the merchandise marketing for the new Muppet movie, um, mostly based on Gonzo's face. But, yeah, just because um, one of the best Muppet films, or at least one of the ones I, I ended up watching a lot as a kid, was the Muppet's Christmas Carol. Mm. And, of course, Gonzo was a narrator in that. And as kind of one of my earliest experiences of the Muppets, I just kind of, I don't know, I, I formed an emotional attachment to, to Gonzo. Couldn't work out what he was. Is he, he's, he's like a bear with the face of a moth. I don't know, but he's wonderful. Um, so he's, he, he, yeah, I think Gonzo is easily the, the you know, one of the best Muppets. The, the shy underdog Muppet, if you will. You can keep your Kermits and your Miss Piggies. Gonzo for me every time. Okay, Gonzo the Magnificent there. Ed? I disagree. I think the true underdog is Rolf the dog, um, who is... Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's uh, initially the pianist for um, for the Muppets, but, I mean, he's always there, and he's always so faithful, and he's always level-headed. He's in the background, but at the same time, he's so awesome. And he and he's the jokes, he's, he says, are always so deadpan, but hilarious. But to me, it is Rolf the dog. He is my favourite. Before, before, OK, we'll go to Chris now, but Chris and Fozzie Bear... Same person, right? Waka waka. Um, Mind blown. I did Come on, they have the same joke book yeah, on the yeah. shelf. I same did, head? I did originally go for Gonzo, but I think actually um, I really like Statler and Waldorf. Oh, yeah. I think the their, their constant heckling is, is just fantastic. There's one bit after a performance where I think Statler is just, he's, he's turned round um, and he's just going, wonderful, bravo, just wonderful. And Waldorf just cuts in going, how would you know you're not even facing the stage? <laughs> Statler turns around looking very annoyed, going, why did you have to tell me I was having such a good time? Um, I also really like Sam the Eagle. I think he's one of the very few deadpan Muppets, and yet that makes him even funnier. I think he's a brilliant Samuel Arrow uh, in Muppets Treasure Island. The original Samuel Arrow in, in, Muppet, in, in Treasure Island is awful. He's a terrible first mate, and he falls overboard, and no one cares because he was a drunk all the time. But Sam Arrow in Muppet Treasure Island is fantastic with just all his safety measures and things like that. Yeah. I think no one minded because the Muppets are made of latex and that tends to float. It's true. But yeah. Or well, uh, latex and foam, aren't they? Yeah. So he'd float, yeah. but he'd be sort of twice Sorry, the size. Sorry, are you saying that the Muppets aren't real? Dangerous ground. No, I, I, I don't know. I don't know where that where that came from. I, I, sorry, Mac. I think I might need to have a lie down. No, no, you, you never not. said that. You just said that they are made of latex and foam. Nothing to say that there aren't living organs inside them. You know, organs that keep them alive. Yes, yes, they definitely have living organs inside. I've checked. Living organs. <laughs> I've, I've, I've checked. As opposed to dead organs. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that, Lo- why am I dust- picturing a oh, sort of thick version of Saw with Loz and Muppets? <laughs> <laughs> I, think only, I, think, I, I think only you can answer that question, man. This- this does oh my not God. look safe. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to question six. <laughs> Kermit the Frog here. Do you want to play a little game? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> With the Lego movie proving popular, indeed so much so that some teachers are using it to inspire their children into writing and creating new plots, what is the best homemade Lego clip on the internet? Uh, we'll just keep this short for time. 
Ed? I love the, uh, there's, there's a guy called um, Raul Uda who, who's uh, made a full-sized 500,000 uh, bricks of Lego into a car, a full-sized car wow. that travels at about 12 to 17 miles per hour. And there's this massive, amazing video of him building this car on superawesomemicroproject.com. And it's just something to behold. Very entertaining and very impressive. Chris? Uh, the Death Star Canteen. Um, which they have, he's just animated it to Eddie Izzard's brilliant Death Star canteen. Um, also found some films by a guy called Michael Hickox, which have over 12 million views. So they've got to be pretty good. Yeah, that is a lot of views. That's that's 12 million more than, than my videos get. <laughs> <laughs> 12 million more than this show gets. Hey, come on. <laughs> We're just biding our time. Sorry, 11.5. <laughs> yeah. Lars. Yeah, the video for the song 8-Bit eight, uh, eight Trip by uh, nerdy bit pop Swedish hipster duo Rimdraglage, or Ninja Moped, are also known, um, is quite an amazing bit of brick-based visual wizardry. Um, there's a bit where they're entirely covered in bricks. There's a bit where a Lego cube rotates and plays out Lego-based scenes from Pong on its faces. There's a bit with some trees. Um, it's the most mind-bending thing I've ever seen anyone do with Lego. Um, and that's saying something. So yeah, that that definitely wins it for me. I'm eight bit, there. eight bit, eight bit trip. Um, give it, give it a YouTube search. Ironic that a Swedish person has done the best thing with a Danish export. They won't like that. Yeah, what the yeah, Norwegians ever done? They didn't, they didn't, they didn't really. tell, they didn't tell Lego they were going to do it. Mm. The Norwegians ever done anything, Chris? No, Norwe- what Norwegians in terms of Lego? Yeah, I'm sure they have. Um, no, no, I'll have to say that as a Google search. Well, I'm sure that we have Danish bacon and the, and then obviously, yeah, Lego, Lego, Le- Lego moose. There might Lego be Lego moose. moose. You know who's never done anything for us? The, the Romans. Romans. <laughs> Romans, yeah, absolutely. What have the Romans ever done for us? Well, apart from medicine, aqueducts, <laughs> sanitation. <laughs> let's oh. let's get let's move on to somebody who has done lots. Apparently, active mums. The more active the mother, the more active their children will be. But who is the world's busiest mother? Ed. The Queen. No, look, come on. We joke that she doesn't do a lot, but she undertakes constitutional representative duties. She gives consent for acts of parliament. She does a lot of other things. And she's a mother, for goodness sakes, and a grandmother. And she is probably the busiest mother in the world, I'd say. There we go. Keep it short and sweet. Boom. Chris. I'd like to say that apparently there is a Lego film about Norway travelled by a Lego couple, which has 10,000 views. So there you are. I say Mother Nature, just mm. trying to cope with all 7 billion of us. That, that's, that's, that's busyness at its height. Um, in terms of real mothers, Tanya Su- Sullivan is a homeschooling super mum, according to Daily Craft, with a brood of 11. And she's got one on the way. There's, someone needs to just sort of... Shake her and just go, no, stop it, enough is enough. <laughs> there needs to be a limit. I also like that the Telegraph article says, how does she manage it? And you just want to say, well, Telegraph, when a man and a woman love each other very much, <laughs> they have a special hug. <laughs> and that'll be their next front cover headline. They have a special hug and somehow raise 11 children. <laughs> Small army. I went to sleep and when I woke up, it was just there, this bump. Yep. Uh, Loz, finally... Uh, probably Michelle Obama, who accidentally described herself as a busy single mother last year in an interview in Vermont. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, she does loads campaigns for human rights, political campaigns a lot. Um, and she's a very busy working mother. You know, she's got two kids and a steady job. Her husband, um, he works for the government, I think. He's, I think he's in, in the planning office or something. Mm. Um, so he's working as well. It's a, it's a, it's a tough life. You know, standard working day for her. Do a round of interviews. Write some speeches, kick the, pick the kids up from school, text her husband to remind him to pick up the uh, nuclear codes on the way home from work. And it's, it's a non-stop job. So, yeah, I'm going to nominate her as the world's busiest mother. On to question eight now. A terrorist pheasant has been attacking cats, dogs and delivery drivers in Cambridgeshire. Possibly my favourite news story of the week, this one. Phil the Angry Pheasant, as it's called, <laughs> has been labelled a complete lunatic... <laughs> and kept a learner driver stuck in her car for 20 minutes. Gosh. So, other examples of crazy animals. Chris? The pheasants are revolting. Um, I'd, say, I'd say fainting goats are pretty 
mad. I'm sure, I, I don't know, I'm sure, I'm assuming you're all familiar with fainting goats. The sort of animals that they sort of run, and if they're startled in any way, or they think they're about to be attacked, their legs sort of do the sort of rigor mortis thing. And they stop, and they just keel over. And they just stay there for about four or five seconds. And this is supposed to be a defense strategy. It's not. They're helpless. They can't do anything. The predator's not going to go, oh, no, you've fallen over. Well, I, no, I'm not going to touch you now. No, it's going to go in for the kill. This is the worst defense mechanism ever. Some other facts I found were apparently beaver's teeth. This is quite terrifying. They never stop growing. They have to keep gnawing because if they don't, the teeth will go into their brain and kill them. God. So they have to, they can, you just imagine this poor beaver sort of looking extremely stressed and going like, I can't stop chewing, can't stop chewing. Snails can grow back eyes if they lose one. I think yeah. that's quite cool. And apparently cows produce more milk when they're listening to relaxing music. If you put on just a bit of Mozart in the background, you get more milk. If you put on uh, dubstep or the sirens that Ed referred to last season, yeah, you, <laughs> you, no you, your, your farm's out of business. <laughs> Chris, there is actually a worse defense strategy than just falling over if you're trying to escape predators, which is to stop dead and then coat your entire body with a barbecue sauce glaze. Has uh, <laughs> that, uh, that sheep found out that time? Lost chased it. Oh, uh, yeah. Although that wasn't barbecue sauce. That was actually uh, a, a chocolate and honey uh, preparation. With, 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 with lip balm. Yeah, a little, 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 little bit more sensual, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not as crazy animals. Apart from uh, the sheep. I, I genuinely saw a photo once taken inside of a shop. Uh, there's a notice on the door that says, use other door because goose will attack. Um, <laughs> but to divert slightly from the topic here, the crows from the, crows from the Pacific island of New Caledonia have been shown to, anything, uh, to be anything but crazy. Um, in fact, they're shown to have the intelligence of a seven-year-old child. Um, so they've been they they've fashioned tools which they use to access insects, or they did experiments on them. And in these experiments, the crows would use heavy objects like stones to cause water displacement, so that food can float to the top of tubes full of water. Um, so they're among the most intelligent animals in the world. And yeah, I'm slight divergence from the topic, but um, but yeah, crows that are as clever as seven year old children. Have they worked out which seven year old child? they've taken the intelligence of and which which well, sort of child is just sort of beating against the windows in this small there's primary there's a seven year old child somewhere in the pacific island i'm guessing in the pacific <laughs> island i'm guessing who spends a lot of time fashioning tools to eat insects and conducting experiments with tubes ah, ah. <laughs> the, the thing that worries me about this is if they are as clever as a seven year old child now i don't know how much you guys remember of being seven but it seemed to involve an awful lot of panda pop and power rangers Oh, um, no, that's not my experience of being Crows seven. hooked on Tamagotchi. <laughs> well, you know, kids, kids, kids like Panda Pop and they like Power Rangers. And th- this makes me worry that the crows are going to form together and make some kind of super robot crow. Um, mm-hmm. But then we could use them to lift Melbourne and carry it to Wales. Yeah, what? What? <laughs> what? Well, yeah, but what? What? You, you, you say you don't remember uh, Power Rangers from when you were when you were seven, Ed? I never what, watched uh, it. What nostalgia nuggets? Do you have any nostalgia nuggets from when you were seven? Um, when I was seven, I I didn't really watch TV. I was out outside doing a lot of nice going out in fields and running around and things. And so. Were you making Were you making tools to to, to eat insects? And I was making experiments with tubes to destroy insects. I think I think you might be the seven year old that they analysed for this crow test. <laughs> I think the truth think about that. It. I'm going to email them, and next time we see the study, it's going to say, you know, crows have been shown to be as clever as Edgar when he was seven. We found your child. Yes. Yeah, the 450 sheep that jumped from a cliff in Turkey a few years back. I think they're pretty crazy. What? Yeah, I, it's about 2005. Um, it was reported that, like, 450, I think it was actually more than that. It was about 1,000 odd sheep jumped to their deaths from a cliff in Turkey. About 450 died, though. And Anything it's just ridiculous because it says like the stunned Turkish shepherds read. who left their herd to graze while they had breakfast watched as 450 yeah. animals died, like falling on top of one another in a in a billowy white pile. It describes it as. Were they possessed by lemmings? I don't know. And apparently, those that jumped later were saved as the pile got higher. <laughs> <and the pool laughs> became... oh, that's horrible, but wonderful, um, Chris. Lemmings don't actually jump off cliffs. It's an old myth. 
Um, oh. But there was a nature documentary filmed, I think, in the 50s by Disney, who were not willing to accept that this was an urban myth and wanted to film it because it was so widely held. So what they did was to actually film a bunch of lemmings jumping off a cliff. And the way they did this was to slowly drive a Land Rover towards them That's so horrible. that they would jump off the cliff. And then they filmed the resulting massacre. That's horrible. Do, 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 do. Disney, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, Pure wow. evil. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, when you wish upon a star, it's the f- scores before the final round. 27 points. Edgar and Loz. Uh, Chris narrowly in the lead on 28. Whoa! Let's take him down! So, <laughs> as we come to the final round, our guests will present a news headline followed by a 20 second summary of the story. The story can either be true and something from the past week's news, or entirely fictional. The other guests will have to guess whether the story is then fact or fiction. Chris, you're in the lead, so you get to pick the running order. Uh, Loz to go first, then Edgar, and then myself. So, Loz, what is uh, your story headline? Uh, My story headline is Ms. Crispy Starts Bacon Revenge Fire. A woman in Utah by the name of Cameo Crispy is facing several charges after police say she tried to set fire to her ex-boyfriend's house by leaving a pound of bacon burning on the stove. The officer who arrived at the scene reported seeing smoke coming out of the front door and a clearly drunk Ms. Crispy. There was a wood stove left open, hot coals on the floor and a baking sheet with a pound of bacon on it sitting on top of a stove burner. Ed, what is your headline? Soloist swaps horn for shoe. A trumpet soloist for the Cavaliers attempted to use his own shoe after his first valve continued to stick so extensively that he forced his horn into a drummer's hand, took off his own shoe, grabbed one of the other trumpet players, marched to the front of the field, and whilst his companion played the solo on his trumpet, he mimicked playing the solo with his own shoe, arching backwards and pretending to play to the stands of the audience. Okay, and Chris last of all. Man forgets about boat for two years. (laughs) Okay, and the story... Yeah, this is apparently a guy in Norway who thought he'd sold a boat and turned out he hadn't and therefore owed about two years' worth of various sort of water taxes and sort of, you know, fees for keeping the boat there. Apparently he was wealthy enough to afford it. Okay, so we've got the bacon revenge, the literal shoehorn, and the man who forgot about his boat. Uh, With the the bacon revenge story, it's specifically that her name was Ms. Crispy. Miss Crispy. Was the uh, Miss Crispy Bacon Revenge. Miss Crispy Bacon Revenge. Was the, uh, yeah, thing that caught me there. Okay, Ed, Chris, do you think that's true or false? <laughs> so hard to tell. <laughs> it's so ridiculous, but it's laws. It could be true. Or it could be false, having come from my strange brain. Or on the other hand, it could be true. Yeah, well, this is the that's thing. That's how the too. game is played. And I'm terrible at these rounds. Ah, uh, I'm just gonna say false. Okay. I'm gonna s- I'm gonna say true. Okay. Uh, the the shoehorn story. Loz. Shoehorn, shoehorn. Part of me feels like Ed started with a pun and worked backwards. Um, <laughs> so much as I love this, I'm gonna say it's false. And Chris. I'm gonna say it's false as well. Okay. Finally, the man who forgot about his boat for two years. What are we thinking on that one? True. Yeah, I'm afraid I happen to know that this is true. So uh, I'm glad I gave my verdict after Edgar, but I'm going to go with true. Okay, so the Miss Crispy Bacon Revenge Fire loss? Entirely true. Cameo Crispy did try to murder her boyfriend with bacon. My goodness. <laughs> Full points to Chris there. Woo! The shoehorn story, Edgar. <laughs> it's true. Oh my gosh! Oh, oh! oh 1989. Quite, quite, quite a while back, but yeah, he true. He did this last time. So it's true. So Ed gets maximum points there. Okay, and the man who forgot about the boat for two years, Chris. It's true. Yeah, <laughs> done. I I hope that you hadn't looked on the BBC News thing. I I was. Ah, I actually saw it. I actually saw it on the Huffington Post. So. Okay. I was thinking of possibly going for, and this is also a true story, that Australia is going to introduce knighthoods, having apparently banned them or discontinued them (laughs) in 1986. I was I was this close to going with the story, but I couldn't go with it because it's currently still only a rumor that men over the age of 21 in North Korea 
are being ordered to adopt their dear leader's hairstyle. Yeah, yeah, no, I did see that. Yeah, yeah, I thought, yeah, I figured people might have seen that as well. Um, so. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, so time for the final scores now, and it's very interesting. On 31 points, it's Loz. Ah. On 32 points, pulling himself up into second place, Edgar. On 33, claiming his first win over Edgar, it's Chris. Hurrah! Well done, Chris. Whoa, that was mighty close. Only two points between all three. I did did technically beat Ed in the Doctor Who final last year, but yeah, my record against him is generally terrible, so... (laughs) I thought he'd done it again. I thought he'd done it again with a shoehorn because last time Loz and I went up against Edgar, he came up with the the story about the Crash Bandicoot, which we both said true and it was false. Yeah. And this time he's done the shoehorn and we both thought it was so... false and it was true. So <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, Leopardy Devil. I want to know where where Ed gets his news his uh, his news stories from. Yeah. Well, this particular one was from, um, I say it's quite old, uh, this incident actually happened in 1989, and it was from a Drum Corps International News, um, how could I put it, it's like a news booklet that comes out like every month or so. Uh, oh, right. I, th- I thought it might have been from Bandcamp Weekly, you know, one of those things they have on <laughs> Have I Got News For You every now and then. <laughs> it's a sort of guest publication. Yeah, well, it's uh, a big twist there at the start of our third series. Um, so, uh, to, to recap how this series is going to run, so we've got 13 episodes. 13 episodes. We, we're, we are going to have our summer break again, just because we appreciate it's it's the summer. Let's go play cricket, or whatever people do. We will be doing a World Cup special as well. Chris, I understand you're going to be on the World Cup special? Yes, absolutely. Yep. Loz, being Welsh, you won't be, because Wales are never at the Football World Cup. Well, you say that, but I think that now... <laughs> And and Ed, if you kick no, football? I, <laughs> I, football is a, a sweaty men kicking balls around. It's not for Sounds me. Sounds good to me. <laughs> hey hey, they you know getting down on the ground. That's totally your thing. No, that's rugby. Ah, <laughs> uh, it's true. Yeah, football is sweaty men kicking a ball around. Rugby is sweaty men kicking each other around. <laughs> um, and we will have a Christmas special this year. Uh, apologies that one didn't happen last year. I did go to New York and and did a, an audition for NBC, but that only got 30 views, so they didn't renew the show. Um, and then I came back and went clubbing quite a lot. So that is why there was no Christmas special, because I was in a nightclub for most of December. Mm, cheesecake gate. No, that was January. Oh, okay. <laughs> No, no. D- December was the was all the all the clubbing. Bit of one D, still popular with the kids. What? <laughs> one Direction. Chris. Direction. I know. We have three D these days. Oh dear! <laughs> Didn't have a bloody mind. <laughs> Four D as well. Anyway, on that uh, joke. Of <laughs> <laughs> sorts. If if we can call it that. Um, thank you to Loz, Ed, and Chris. We shall be back next week with a. Uh, an all-star panel once more um, but in the meantime have a great week and thank you for listening goodbye thank you bye 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 go away kidneys I've got new kidneys <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>